Well, grace and peace to you from God, our creator, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So I have this recurring dream. I've had it for years where uh, I'm back in high school because somehow I missed a class and they discovered it and my diploma has been rescinded. So there, there I am, 40-year-old me, trying to blend in with students and not be late for chemistry class, you know, walking the hallways of my old high school. And I used to think that I was unique, but this, this is something, I guess, is a dream that lots of us have. Have you ever had a dream like that where you ended up missing a whole class you didn't realize or you didn't graduate? And I thought that I was unique. I thought that this was something that happened just to me because I thought that my subconscious was tormenting me for dropping out of high school. That is something I've shared with you before up here, a truth about me that I did not make it through high school. It was and is still a, a source of shame for me, no matter how many college degrees I've earned, which are considerable. <laughs> I'm always aware that I was a bad kid that made mistakes and didn't make it through this basic human tradition in our country. And I've always worried that that legacy would be a source of shame for my children as well. But I'm feeling better about it after something that happened last year. So a little over a year ago, my daughter Abby, who's a college freshman now, uh, she was applying for scholarships. And she comes running into my room, super excited, and she says, Mom, Mom, I think you being a delinquent will actually help me get scholarships. <laughs> Great, Abby. <laughs> Love that you think of me as a delinquent. <sighs> so now I'm thinking my legacy's not so bad, right? Scholarships abound. I guess it's how you look at it. And to the Egyptians, Shifra and Pua they leave a legacy of treachery and betrayal, all right? Their disobeying Pharaoh at this key moment in Egypt's history was just the first domino in a chain of falling dominoes that will eventually lead to Egyptian, the Egyptian demise. They'll lose tons of power in their life because the Israelites continue to grow numerous, and from this moment, Moses was born. To the Israelites... The treachery of these two women was heroic. They left a legacy of life, the beginning of hope, the first steps towards freedom. That Moses li lived through this moment where he could have been massacred and that he led God's people from slavery out of Egypt is impossible without Shifra and Pua. Their bravery their faith in a God they did not yet even know, their compassion, their craftiness will become part of a story told again and again to the Jewish people for generations to come. It's a legacy intentionally woven by God through them to encourage people who would also need to be brave and faithful, compassionate, even crafty themselves. That's what legacies do. That's why we build them. Because we've experienced life, and we know not only the joys, but we know the pitfalls. And we want to make sure that our children and their children after them don't experience those pitfalls, and that they have the tools and resources that they need to navigate this messy life. And legacy building is a divine mandate. That's what that Psalm 78 Jeannie read was all about. God commands us to leave a legacy of faith, to teach children the commandments, to teach them the stories, so that they teach them to their children, and so on and so forth. It's how God plans. It's how God cares for those who are to come. God is planning for the future of his kingdom through the actions of people today. So, what, is, what does all that have to do with the legacy we are working on here at Faith. These last four Sundays, I've talked to you about time, talent, and treasure. And today we are talking about tomorrow, about the legacy that we are going to leave. And what is time and talent and treasure? The, the things that we share, how does that 
create tomorrow to construct the legacy of faith? How does what we do here and now impact the community that we are a part of for generations to come? Well, as I was thinking more about Shifra and Pua, tradition tells us that these were Egyptian women. Not only that, but the context tells us that they were probably working in the household of Pharaoh. So they have absolutely seen what Pharaoh does to people who do not obey their commands, his command rather. And so what gave them, what gave these two Egyptian women the courage to defend Israelites, Hebrews who were slaves? What gave them the courage? Well, they served as midwives to the Hebrew people. So they were with them all the time. Every waking hour, they were probably with Hebrew women. And in that time, they were around God's people and the way that they prayed and the, the God that they worshiped probably impacted them. And I wonder if being around God's people didn't grow in them compassionate hearts. I wonder if they weren't transformed and influenced by rubbing up against God's people and the faith that they shared. I wonder if they weren't experiencing what gardeners call a marigold effect. You show us a marigold up here, Maureen. Marigolds, right? You all know these pretty bright orange flowers, right? They're, they're kind of popular. And most of us could recognize them right away because they're bright and they're orange and they're pretty, but for gardeners, they're not just pretty flowers. They are powerful companion plants. That's what gardeners know about them. When planted next to more vulnerable plants, marigolds can do powerful things. They provide protection, helping these more vulnerable plants grow and thrive. When planted next to vegetables, marigolds repel predatory insects, the same kind of insects that usually you can only get rid of with like chemical pesticides. And when planted next to vegetable gardens, marigolds, or I'm sorry, when planted next to flower beds, marigolds attract pollinators so that the flower bed becomes even more vibrant and colorful. And when planted next to crops, marigolds act as slug traps by allowing slugs to munch on their leaves instead of moving on to the crops. Marigolds make other plants thrive. And that is, I think, how Shifra and Pua found themselves able to have the courage and strength to leave the legacy they did. They had the benefit of being planted next to God's people and absorbing the goodness of God. And that faith is why I think we are here and why we have planted ourselves in this community. That is why we give of ourselves to secure a lasting legacy and presence here. That is why we build this facility and that preschool. Because as long as we are here, telling the story of Jesus and doing the work of feeding and healing and sharing God's love and forgiveness, the people in this community will have a marigold of faith protecting them, a companion planted next to them that will help them out there grow and thrive in this messy world. That's my take on legacy. That is why we push to stay where we're at. That's why we push to grow and to thrive. Now that's my take, and as I've told you each week, I'm not an expert in this stuff, so I'm relying on some of our parishioners to help tell this story. And this week, Ken Reiner, Doc Reiner, is going to tell us his take on legacy. And you might recognize him from those HSHS commercials. <laughs> Quite the local celebrity I've rang up here. So excited about it. So if uh, you could bring the lights down, and Mark will... Cue it up. you got to kind of lean in. Our sound's not real great. I'll work on it for the next video series. I had parents who financially did not have um, a lot, but gave to others. They were products of the Depression. Uh, probably did better than the other members of their family did. 
survived World War II, survived the dep Depression. And I saw in them to their day where at times, you know, the expression didn't have two nickels to run uh, together, would welcome people into our home for, for dinners. So I was just a child. There was always room for another guest at the table. And that guest was made to feel like the most important person on that. So I think... Oh, I think the legacy or mentoring um, people who I looked up to said these are important things and you will get great you will get such joy from them they were absolutely correct they gave of themselves of their time and talents more than they could have ever gotten with a paycheck at the hospital um, I saw them stay extra do the you know go that extra yard for people and these are things I said look at that and look what it returns um, I wanted to be like them who just thought of giving not you know, well, if I invite them, will I get something in return? No, they just did it because it was the right thing to do. And they were clearly blessed by that type of, uh, uh, that attitude. You know what, that reminds me of the, uh, is a passage about the very, very poor woman that gives, she only has a, a penny or two to her name, but she gives it all. That was so moving to me over the years. She gave um, everything. And, and, you know, I've seen people give a lot, but never everything, she gave everything. Yeah. What do you hope for the church? I want this family to continue to grow. We have something very special here, and there's no question about it. I've, I've, uh, I've, I use the analogy to sports. I've played on many championship teams with great teams of, 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 of docs and nurses, etc. We have something special here. This is a championship team, and I want to see this. And I, I love the our, our, our mission statement, how we've moved out of the building into the community. And with that, uh, for instance, Kristen and I are very involved in unity. So our church, um, I loved the presentation the other day uh, uh, about Habitat. We are tonight, Monday night here, pulling up among the cars for community meals. Okay, we are moving out and we are touching others as we should. We are rolling along uh, like onward Christian soldiers. So I want to see that for the church. So. I always feel like I, I need to do better with those transitions. I just cut people off. But Ken had so much great stuff to say. And I just love the analogy that he used that, that we're on a championship team. I mean, I like that because I'm competitive. But the truth is... We do have this unique place here. And if I wasn't such a spotlight hog, I would just end right now and let Ken have the last word. But I'm competing with local celebrity news and stuff, so I have to keep talking to make sure that, you know, Ken doesn't best me. And I, I just want to say a few more things, just one more thing, actually. And I, I want to sum up this entire four-week series because we've been talking about time, talent, and treasure. And I worry that it's possible that you've heard me say to you, you need to do something, that you need to do something, that it is up to you. And I have wanted to encourage you to take a look at your time and your talent and your treasure and to examine how you're making use of it in your life because we are not helpless people here. We are called to act alongside of God to shape tomorrow. But I also want you to know that this place, this church, isn't something that we are creating. It's something that God is holding. In the same way that God and Jesus Christ holds our lives on the cross, God is holding us here. And that holding will happen whether you're at your best moment or whether you are at your worst, whether you come here today in a time of great blessing in your life or you are coming here in a time of great heartache and sorrow and you're struggling, God is holding us. And whether you can give a little or a lot of your time, talent, and treasure, it is God's faithfulness that shapes our life and legacy here. And nothing sums that up more for me than this box that is really nondescript and kind of boring. <laughs> but I haven't, um, I haven't decided what to do with the stuff inside just yet. I thought we could work this out together. But this box actually contains hundreds of items. Hundreds. It's got letters, emails, 
cards, drawings that children have made, rocks, sticks, and they all came from you. Two years ago, your church leadership got together and we knew that we'd have to shut down the church, right, like everybody else. And Carl Buch said in that moment, I just don't understand. Church is where I come when I'm afraid. And so we knew that we still had to have some way to keep us connected. And so we invited you to write, to write to your church. And in those first few weeks of the pandemic, when we just didn't know what was going to happen in the world and what we were going to do, you did write. You wrote hundreds of letters. You wrote about your fears and your worries. You wrote about your medical issues and your family squabbles. Got some good stuff in here. You wrote about your confessions and you asked for forgiveness. You wrote about the happy things that were still going on in your lives that you wanted to share with your brothers and sisters. And every day I'd come in and I'd check the mailbox and there were more letters and sometimes goofy things. Someone put a potato in there from their garden. And I'd put it up here on the altar, and after a while, it was just piled so high. And all I could think when I was looking at it was that even though you weren't here, God was holding your lives here. And there are letters in this box from people who never made it back after the pandemic, who never came back to church. And there are people here now who are a part of the life of this congregation who never wrote a letter, and yet still, God holds your lives here. It is something I know for sure. And in the sharing of our time, talents, and treasure, and tomorrow, I know that we will, and in the future, I know we'll, we will fight. And we will fail. We will succeed, we will rejoice, we'll baptize babies, we'll marry people, we'll witness divorces and tragedies and funerals, and some people will leave, others will stay, new people will come. But in this place, this sacred place where the Holy Spirit dwells, and you can be assured that it will always hold your lives dear and remind you that you are intentionally woven together in this time and place for a purpose, and that you are fearfully and wonderfully made to be a part of God's plan for this community and this body of brothers and sisters. Thanks be to God. Amen.